uh, have been dealing here with the very heart of the Christian religion or the Christian faith. I wonder if, uh, in light of what you have just said, you would care to say uh, what uh, the place of, of the Christ is in this, the relationship of the Christ to the moral life, to moral commandments. Yes, now this is, uh, there are double answer can be given. The first is very obvious. The manifestation of the principle of love in an unique and incomparable way is the cross of Jesus who is called the Christ. And uh, there we have a life which is in every moment uh, determined by God and therefore by love and which never has a conflict between himself and God, himself and love. So I would say the first is the manifestation of the principle of love in a personal life, in a real personal life. Then the second is something else. And this brings me back to your question on moralism. We didn't discuss before what is the motivation of the moral act. How are we able to act morally at all? We certainly are not able simply by ob trying to obey the moral law. Uh, the more seriously we take this, the more the despair is into which we fall. People like Paul and Augustine and Luther and Calvin are great examples of this. Uh, so there must be another power which makes us love in the right way in, in the concrete situation. And this power I would call the power of grace or of reconciliation. And this power is manifest also in the picture of Jesus as a Christ in the New Testament. So he reveals both the principle of love and the way in which love can be actualized. Would you say that this makes the uh, church necessary to this kind of morality or moral living? The church, you ask? Yes. Uh, is Christ known uh, other than through the church? No. The church is for me the living tradition of these principles which I just have developed. And only within the church there is the possibility of uh, receiving this power directly. But I must here make a uh, qualification. If you say the church then this sounds very much as the churches as we see them today in this country and in the Western world where we have Christian churches and a few Christian churches also in other continents. Now, of course, in these churches, the church is present. But the church is not only present in the so-called Christian churches. It's present wherever the spirit, the divine spirit, grasp the human spirit. And uh, this happens not only in the churches, it happens also uh, outside these churches, which sometimes I have called for this reason the latent churches in, op uh, in opposition to the manifest church. So my concept of church is much larger than the churches which you can see at the crossroads or at uh, Middletown or somewhere. Uh, I think of the uh, present of the, I call it the spiritual community, which is present not only in all these churches, but also far beyond them in so-called secular groups of all kinds, in other religions, in Judaism and so on. Uh, so if I answered your question with yes, then I must now qualify my yes by the distinction of the manifest and the latent church. Are you saying now that the manifest church is the institutional church as we know it in history? The latent church is the church which is 
other than or outside of the institu uh, institutional church. And if this is what you are saying, are you in reality saying that Christ is available to morality outside of the uh, institutional church? Yes. Now, first, a little qualification to this word. When I hear the word institutional church, I think not only of the minister and the elders and the church building and the services and all this, but I also think at the personal life of the members of these churches, their personal religion, their uh, encounter with God. This is one thing. Then the other thing is what I call the latent church. They are also, we have groups which are organized more or less, I think of some political groups, some youth movements, from some social groups, uh, some all kinds of communities uh, which are driven by something which belongs to the principle of love. And there is also the individuals in it who have their personal life. And I must tell you, in my whole life, I have met so many people of whom I had the feeling that the love of Christ was driving them uh, without their knowing that it has anything to do with Christ. And if I was asked by students of theology how I could say such a thing, I simply say because Jesus said it. Uh, namely, in Matthew 24, he praises those who uh, work love without even knowing his name. Dr. Tillich, uh, you were speaking of uh, the, the love of uh, uh, Christ, which is at the center of the Christian faith, we were speaking of this in relation to morality a little while ago. The quest, uh, this uh, suggested another question to me, which has some relation to what you've just been saying also, I think. Uh, let me uh, describe very briefly the situation out of which the question comes. About uh, four years ago or so, I was involved in a conference of an international uh, character uh, of uh, representatives of student Christian movements around the world. and. Uh, one speaker who was invited to speak to this group uh, was a French existentialist, a follower of Jean-Paul Sartre. The theme of the conference was Jesus Christ the Reconciler. I assume that when we speak of the love of Christ, we mean also a power to reconcile people and heal, heal their separations and divisions. But the uh, existentialist said, he not being a Christian, that for him, uh, Christ was not an answer here, but part of the problem. That uh, what uh, kept him apart from other people was more than anything else this business of Jesus Christ to being taken as an absolute, which he could not accept. And therefore, to him, this was not an answer at all. What would you say in response I would agree with him, as the situation is, not as the situation should be. The situation is now so, for innumerable people inside and outside the churches, that the answer, uh, Jesus Christ, as it's usually said, is entirely ununderstandable. And uh, one of the reasons for this is a uh, very seemingly uh, unimportant thing, but actually very important, namely that the word Jesus Christ is not a name like Paul Tillich, but that Jesus Christ means the man Jesus who has the function to be the Christ. And Christ means the bringer of a new eon, as it was called, a new reality, a new being, as I like to call it, a new power of love, or however you want to call it. And if you say, Jesus, who is the bringer of a new eon, uh, a new period of history, then of course the whole situation changes. Then at least the question becomes meaningful. Uh, can we say this? And what does that mean? So I am very much in sympathy with this existentialist. If the acceptance of the Jesus as a Christ is a doctrinal law imposed on people who don't even know what the word means, then I would say we have to rebel against it. And my whole theological work is an attempt to interpret the meaning of this statement that Jesus is a Christ. Some years ago, Dr. Tillich, uh referring to the present situation of the church. You uh, wrote a book or a collection of essays were published under the title, The Protestant Era, 
And uh, I think you made the statement at that time that you had suggested the title, The End of the Protestant Era. I wonder if uh, you would tell us what you intended.